All right, hello everyone. We're gonna begin as we always do with our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge, honor, and respect that much of the land we are gathered on is part of traditional unceded territories of many different indigenous peoples of Canada. Welcome to another episode of Veg Networking Canada where vegan plant-based professionals connect and collaborate. Today, we have a very special guest with us. Like many of our studious special guests, she studied at Simon Fraser University. She was previously the executive chef at multiple restaurants in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. The author of The Art of Plant-Based Cheese Making, which came out in 2017, and there is a newly revised version that came out this year in 2021. And this book is the winner in the vegan category at the Gourmand World Cookbook Awards. Today, we have the co-founder, CEO, and master chef at Blue Heron Creamery, 100% dairy-free plant-based vegan cheeses. Welcome to Veg Networking Canada, Karen McAfee. Okay. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, everybody. It's a really a huge pleasure to be here um, and really great to uh, get to talk to a group of like-minded professionals around with a similar ethos, because that is not always the case these days. <laughs> so <laughs> this is a real treat for me. Well, it's a real treat for us. We're thrilled to have you here. And the fact that our group kind of spans its reach across Canada, I know that there's going to be people from the East Coast tuning in, drooling and waiting to get their hands on your product. But let's <laughs> let's start with our first question, which is what is your personal vegan origin story? That's a great question. And I love that you start with the vegan, by the way, and it's not just your, your story as of whatever. Um, that um, I've been, I guess, what I would call officially vegan for nearly 11 years now. Uh, but I was, but it starts so much earlier. I was nine when I started to really say to my mom, "Yeah, I'm not doing this anymore. Like, I'm not eating meat. I'm not, I'm not participating in this blood fest." Um, and and it started by trips to our uh, my uncle's farm in Saskatchewan and one particular occasion where he took us to a laboratory because uh, my uncle uh, used to raise cattle. And for me, then that moment was so clear, the, the smell of fear, the smell of death and hearing the cries. And it had a really profound impact on me. Prior to nine, I just wasn't a big meat eater in our home. I would feed meat to our dogs. I would try in every sort of way not to consume it. Um, by nine, after this particular event, it just crystallized, I think, what was already happening for me in my head. Like I was already not leaning in that direction. Uh, and I remember in that moment at my uncle's farm and thinking and looking at the adults around me and thinking, how do they not hear this? How I don't understand how they don't also hear this fear and and feel this pain and and even my sister for that matter who had a very different experience of that so by the time i was 12 i tried sort of asserting myself my parents at nine and that didn't happen so i continued to feed meat on the table to the dogs <laughs> in our home uh, but when i was 12 i i was more serious and i approached my mom again and my mom uh didn't balk, but she did say, now you start cooking your own meals. I'm not cooking two separate meals for the family and working two jobs. And so she brought bought me a book. Um, Brenda Davies was the the author. It was and it was on how to how to keep yourself healthy and have a, I don't remember the exact title, but I remember that the theme of it was very much how to do it right, basically, like how not to make yourself unwell when you're going to do that. And so by I grew up in a small community called Alert Bay. It's a, on an island up near uh, uh, just off the west coast of east coast of Vancouver Island. And so I would take a ferry over to Port McNeil and ride my bike 46 kilometers up to Port Hardy to buy soy milk. <laughs> because there was nowhere in Alert Bay that had it. Uh, and then off and on for a few years, I was vegetarian slash vegan and then, and then committed fully to vegan uh, very naturally. Ethically, it was already in alignment. And then physically, I'm allergic to milk and eggs. So it was very naturally and easy for me to finish that transition. 
Wow. Uh, at nine years old, understanding that food does not bleed, scream, or cry is is quite uh, quite an experience. Um, amazing. Okay, so shifting gears from your personal story, <laughs> tell us more about your beginnings as an entrepreneur. I'm sure it's not with blue hair. It probably was <laughs> before. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it's funny. I've never really thought of myself as entrepreneurial, but when I look back at things prior to even Blue Heron, I yeah, I, 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 I guess I was. I, I had a very early company for a while called Good Girl, Bad Girl Preserves, uh, where my business partner and I, we would take um, rescued food and convert it into uh, culinary preserves and jams and jellies and also teach workshops around preservation techniques and methods canning um, we had done some work with the sharing farm in richmond around helping add value to their end of season products so they could sell it at the farmers market um, the richmond sharing farm in vancouver in bc um, grows food for the richmond food bank and so by helping them convert end of season produce that might not sell into other products that they could actually help them to raise funds for continuing their work. So that we we were really focusing on trying to get that off the ground. Uh, <laughs> and then I started, and then I landed the job as an executive chef. Um, I had another company prior to that called Araneus Designs, which was focused on taking basically reclaiming uh, already used wool, like taking it from sweaters and re unraveling it and then reconstituting it into different pieces um, as a way of uh, reducing material waste and and reusing what's already available in, in the textile framework and, and using plant materials like bamboo, just to this day still one of my favorite textiles to work with. Uh, and that that particular project uh, was starting to take off when I got the job offer for, as an executive chef and I at the same day I got an offer to have some of the pieces I'd been producing in, in the other one uh, be shot for an editorial shoot and I ended up choosing the chef route instead. <laughs> Wow. Well, your ideas back then were uh, ahead of the curve because, as you know, there's companies right now that are uh, repurposing uh, otherwise would be waste food into product yeah. uh, businesses. We've actually interviewed them who, you know, are turning chopsticks into tables and yes. things. So really, really interesting ideas. So shifting gears now to your industry right which mm -hmm. is true cheese not cheese with a z but cheese that actually is science-based bacteria uh, fermented cultured all of that good stuff mm -hmm. what are some trends in your industry that's a great question because it's a pretty rapidly moving sector right now um there's uh so Oh, big, big question. I'm gonna to try to do the shorter version. <laughs> um, so in, in the sector as a whole, there's sort of three broad categories of product groupings that I sort of identify. There's sort of the, the dia style products, which are really reconstituted fractions of material. So it might be some protein powder, some starch powder, some sort of fat con constituent part, and then they're reformulated usually through a cooking process or some sort of heat process into cheese analogs. So cheese of the Z. Then there's other products and many of them are quite delicious. Like my friends at Nuts for Trees, Margaret's fantastic and, and Melissa with Spread and Kitchen. And they do fermented work, but they also add Add some other ingredients into this whether it's a cacao butter or a coconut oil that sort of help things firm up but they're not the firming up isn't through an aging process per se so it's it's more using this fat that solidifies at a cooler temperature that helps lend um, uh, some structural integrity to their product and also just creaminess and yumminess uh, then there's a, a much smaller niche of us that are focusing much more closely on the fermentation side and on the use of a wider range of microbial cultures uh, in order to really get a broader range of texture and flavor development because particular bacteria do different kinds of things. And so we focused a lot on what species we use and how we use them and what materials do they want to work with. And some of that work hasn't made all of its way out into, into our product lines yet. That's all coming. We've got a very exciting 24 months ahead. 
uh, because we have a big announcement coming around a, a, around a particular R&D uh, project. <laughs> um, but there's a new trend that's evolving in the vegan dairy sector altogether, and that's the use of synthetic biology and precision fermentation to produce animal-free proteins. Specifically, whey and casein is the focus. Um, and in, in that technology, the focus is on using microbial microbes uh, to produce the constituent protein parts and the, so basically as in, as process engineers and they produce the microbes produce the ingredient then that those protein parts then would be reconstituted with other materials as a medium to make an animal free milk um, animal free ice cream animal free cheese so this is a really big and very rapidly evolving part of the sector that where there's a number of companies that are really deep Sorry to interrupt you, Karen. I think uh, might have a connection issue. I think we can't hear you right now. Am I the only one, folks? Happy crappy Wi-Fi. Sorry, guys. There we go. Can you, you hear me now? Sorry. My, my Wi-Fi suddenly just sort of like whispered off. <laughs> Uh, so in that in that space, which is moving very fast, uh, big dollars are being raised. Um, the intent and the design of that work is that one, it'll actually be much more sustainable than than any version of animal agriculture, um, and and their intent is that in doing so is to be able to produce proteins that can really help improve overall performance and functionality of future vegan cheeses there there's a lot in this realm for discussion there's a whole lot around uh how successfully the work can be done they're all just in the prototype development stage uh, we are engaged in a number of conversations with some parties in this arena uh, in in terms of being prospective participants and helping to develop some prototypes um, but i and I'm very interested in the arena because the science component very much interests me. But I, I actually think there's a lot of prospect for fusing that technology with already plant-based materials and improving their functionality because, quite frankly, oat milk makes really tasty cheese. <laughs> I'm not like from from a just a cheese maker's perspective. I'm not necessarily wanting to get rid of the flavor of oat milk in something. But in dairy cheese, there's goat and sheep and and cow milk, and they all taste different. So, from from my perspective and sort of Blue Heron's perspective, ours is more about expanding cheese making as a concept and what that means. So, I think it's a really interesting time for for the sector right now because of how precision fermentation is going to be impacting things and and investors are very heavily favoring those technologies right now cell agriculture is a very deeply burgeoning excellent amazing so the tr it sounds like we could do an entire podcast, an entire episode on what are the trends in the industry. Um, so it sounds like moving away from cheese analogs, moving away from cultured cheese with additives and moving towards precision fermentation, cell agriculture, and essentially creating vegan whey and vegan casein is what it sounds like the trends are. That is very much what the trends are. So cheeses that may evolve or 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 products that may evolve from that would be called vegan but not plant-based and that's sort of where like that's going to create a whole different category of products evolving from that technology absolutely beautiful and you're right it is technology it's very much so science-based so i could see how we could take yeah. the entire time and talk about that but yeah. <laughs> yeah. with the short amount of time that we have with you here today moving on um, I'm sure you're not going to leak anything that you, you, you can't say, but <laughs> the next question is, where is Blue Heron going in the future? Well, so that's a great question, and I, and I can do a, some teaser announcements. So we are, we are getting ready. Uh, we're doing a, a raise here in the autumn because we are looking to build a couple of new plants 
we are, we haven't quite landed exactly where yet. Um, there may be one in Ontario, uh, or perhaps in the United States. There's some work to be done there. Uh, there will be a name shift coming. Uh, Blue Heron's not disappearing, but the parent company name is going to be changing, um, and that's so that we can make the entry into the U.S. a little easier without trademark infringements. Um, and we're getting ready to build uh, an R&D site in Vancouver and prospectively a new Vancouver storefront. Uh, it's sad, it will be sad to leave the little tiny one, but we're pretty excited about the prospect of a, a space that's a little bit bigger and allows us to do a few more things. So U.S. and nationwide is on the horizon. Uh, we're currently with Save on Foods right now. And today I just found out we've been sighted in Manitoba. So I didn't, I didn't know that. So that's cool. Um, and so national distribution and then U.S. entry. And we're, we're sending some samples off to uh, South Korea this week, actually. <laughs> so. Where we've we've got things happening in the background. <laughs> wow, we were not expecting that uh, uh, that <laughs> much of an answer in terms of where are you going in the future. But so excited because uh, Blue Heron, uh, even just you yourself personally, have quite that like cult following of people who just are so excited to see the expansions and the scaling and the growth. Um, so. No, no right or wrong answer here. Uh, maybe it's something in the pipeline. Who knows? But are there any charitable organizations that your your company's looking to support or currently does? Yeah, we're actually so that kind of work is actually so important to us. And actually, last year when we were doing our year end financials, we actually. We lost you again. Rasta to several, several animal sanctuaries, um, Humane Society on a couple of specific campaigns, uh, to vast Vancouver area survivors of uh, torture. Uh, we've contributed support to in the past. Uh, there's The list is long, and I can't remember all of it. Uh, growing chefs, so like food justice and food uh, education has been important to us. Uh, and we're pursuing our B Corp certification. So as a way of codifying as a company what our principles and ethos are. So we've, it's been an intense scale up year this year. So our community work's been a little bit uh, pulled back, but we're developing the plan for really hitting it hard for next year so we can make sure we're maintaining the kind of um, engagements that we like. So there's a number of organizations we care about and, um, and Happy Hurts a near and dear one. <laughs> to us and groups that do uh, work in the animal realm are obviously very important to us. And one that's really important for me are some of the groups that are revolving around the animals and science, um, animal use and science uh, groups that are starting to create different um, pedagogies and approaches to help avoid using animals in scientific work. Absolutely beautiful because it just goes back to your whole ethos, right? Uh, animals are not products, right? And yeah. animals are not food, they're not objects, they're not property. Yeah. So remarkable. Um, based on the fact that everybody who is, you know, part of this group as a member or special guest and those who listen are entrepreneurial and business owner minded, keeping that in mind, do you have a book, podcast, or app that you would recommend? Oh, gosh. Um... A classic book wise, Peter Singer's Animal Liberation is a classic for me. I, I tend to more, I'm a bit of a nerd. So, I mean, and what I mean by that is that I can't confess to having all the most up to date information on like podcasts, for, uh, for instance, but. Um, I actually can't name any podcast right now. My head is a blank. I've just been listening to like biology podcasts. <laughs> and, but oh, on that front, ologies is good, even if it's not animal welfare specific. But ologies is one of my favorite podcasts because uh, of her approach to information. Um, I think for me, it's more I look at, at just what people are doing in projects in general. And that's where, where I look for my inspiration. 
Brilliant. Yeah. And then I think you have a friend as well who's got a podcast. I think it's the No Bullshit Podcast, Kar- Karina. Oh, I can't hear you. Oh, no problem. Sorry. I, I, um, my internet. <laughs> It's okay. it's okay. We can hear you. Uh, I can't hear you. Sorry. That's Where okay. Did my internet go. We'll see if it comes back for you. I can't hear anything. I can see everyone. Yeah, we can hear you. We'll see if okay, it comes I can, back. I can see everyone moving. Maybe type in the chat, Justin. My audio cut out. Okay, hello. What is going on here? That is, oh, brands, brands I learned from. Great question. Me, Oko. Oh, you can hear you. Okay, great. That's perfect. So Miyoko, <laughs> Miyoko, uh, Miyoko's Creamery is, I think, is an obvious one for me, but not so much necessarily from the cheese perspective, but from her sheer just being unafraid of putting animals out front first in her. Anytime she's presented her brand, she hasn't pulled it back because of investors. She hasn't pulled back her intent around how she where where she comes from. Uh, so it's made it. I see what happened here. I see what happened here. Okay, just a second. Great. There we go. I I don't know how that happened. <laughs> um, so she's been so brave about addressing animal rights in everything she does, and her big project now about trying to work with dairy farmers to get them to convert their their whole programs away from animal. I think I find her work quite inspiring that way. Um, other local brands, there's local brands that inspire the hell out of me. Uh, Naomi at Say Hello Sweets, for instance, um, her sheer commitment to her craft, the way she wants to do it. Uh, Ashna Wilden at Kula Kitchen, who I think has brought a refreshing, a refreshing energy into vegan food and are especially um, with respect to bringing Afrocentric cuisine into the front. I think that's been a really huge boon for Vancouver-based, plant-based, and vegan, the vegan community. So I think that's tremendous. Um, uh, there's, oh gosh, there's so many. And it's not always the big players that I'm inspired by. It's knowing the intimate stories of so many smaller companies and crazy places. Um, Arteza Tasmania in, in, in Tasmania is the cheese company julia there's been a huge inspiration um my my uh my cohort i suppose at new roots in switzerland they're pretty amazing and doing incredible things with their commitments to green built plant uh they're they have a twenty five thousand square foot plant that's uh fully green powered and their commitments to direct trade i think that's incredible um, I'm never shy about saying how much I admire Melissa Mills from Spreadham Kitchen. <laughs> um, she's uh, she's a powerhouse who's managed to do it her way, and I really respect that a lot. Uh, so she's she went out there and got it, <laughs> and it's incredibly hard in the food manufacturing realm to do that. <laughs> wow, what a list! And uh, you can hear us now. Yes. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. What a what a list of strong um, female owned and operated businesses. I know that that is important to you and yeah. as it should be as it relates to the complete inequality of funding that uh, women owned businesses do receive mm-hmm. um, and everything that uh, the, the women female owned businesses are doing. We need more of so it's just an excellent, excellent list you just gave us. And we're here at our eight uh, conversation starter, eighth question, which is always prefaced by saying, uh, there's no right or wrong answer. It can be short, it can be long. Um, and as well to, um, this is not the time to be modest, but what is some <laughs> advice that you have for entrepreneurs, business owners who may be just starting, maybe in the middle or maybe at an exit? Oh yeah, I mean that's great because I don't. I actually don't think there's any single answer. I, I, when I I do get asked that kind of question a fair bit, and I just don't think there's a silver bullet answer for anybody. I think, uh, like I, I listicles, I think are 
rarely helpful uh, except in broad ways but one one thing that is i is not sexy to say but is true is uh if you're starting out get yourself really deeply knowledgeable about your numbers <laughs> Know your numbers, know your numbers, know your numbers. It's so, 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 so important to helping you understand what kind of strategic moves you can make when it's time. Understand your cost of goods. Spend that time. It's a pain in the rear end. It's not as fun as doing uh, the creative work. Um, but it is so critical to the survival of your business. And it, and if you're not, if you don't feel capable or if you don't, or you're overwhelmed or you're tired, uh, make that investment commitment to finding someone who can assist you with it because it's absolutely fundamental to moving your business forward. Absolutely. You heard it here, folks. Business is based on numbers. So knowing your numbers is is the piece of advice that Chef Karen is going to be giving you today. And I'll risk putting some words in your mouth here. I'm sure that you're a believer in this as well when it comes to advice is that you know, that old ancient African proverb, if you want to go uh, fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. And that just dovetails off of your point about if yeah. it's not a skill set you have, but you know it's important, bring those people in who can fill those gaps and everybody's going to be better off. It's a hundred percent. I believe in that a hundred percent. I um I, like it's it relates to blue heron like i when i was when this project initiated it was just me and then it's been this continual sort of sort of evolution beyond that into bringing in skillful people people that know more than i do uh people that have other ideas and people that have an ability to help move things forward and and absolutely some projects one person can lie in that forward but you don't always have to do that. Will it be different than maybe what you expected to do? Yeah, sure, but that's not always bad. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So uh, just before we sort of outro you and say goodbye and yeah. let you get back to what you do, is there anything maybe that you wanted to mention that we missed or? No, those were actually some of the best questions I've ever been asked in an interview. <laughs> So that was, that we're, was we're, great. We're so happy. It's a, Veg Networking Canada is definitely a collective effort from everybody involved. We're always seeking feedback and growth. So it's it's a pleasure to hear that. Everybody's going to be happy to hear it. All right, everybody listening, you can find out more. Definitely salivate more on Instagram at Blue Hair and Cheese. Exactly how it sounds, Blue Hair and Cheese. And it's the same on the web, www.blueheronandcheese.com. Thank you, Master Chef Karen. Have a wonderful day. Have a great day, you guys. Nice to meet you all and re-meet you all. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.